Faith family, how are you today? Good. Obviously, today we're going to be talking about love, and we're going to be talking about love from Jesus' perspective. You know, when I was writing that song, I didn't realize that I would also be preaching a message on love at the same time, Um, but I'm really excited to be able to share it with you guys. Um, And my hope and my prayer is that we'll be encouraged, we'll be inspired, and we'll even be challenged a little bit, but in a good way by the love of Jesus. All right? As you heard earlier, Our pastors are in India, so I thought it would be good to take a moment to give them a shout out. So if you guys want to join me on the count of three, let's yell out, we miss you pastors. All right, one, two, three. We miss you pastors. Yes, we love you. We miss you and uh, we can't wait till you get back, but we're praying for you as you're in India. Such an honor and a privilege to be able to be a part of sharing God's love with those people. So pray you have a great time and uh, we look forward to all the updates when you get back. Today we're starting a new series, and the series is called The Jesus You May Not Know. I'm really excited about this series because I know most of us in this room today, we're familiar with Jesus. If you're not familiar with Jesus, then I'm really glad you're here because what a great day to be in church because we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the central most figure to our faith. And while many of us are familiar with Jesus, though, I find a couple things are often true. One, Jesus has been very misportrayed and misrepresented, right? Whether it be in culture, sometimes even from Christians and sometimes even from the church. And so while we may be familiar with Jesus, sometimes everything that we know about him maybe isn't exactly who he is whenever we read the Bible. The second thing about Jesus is often we can be familiar with Jesus, but you know, maybe we know about his birth and his death and his resurrection, but there's so much more that we can learn about Jesus. His life is so significant. He was the most perfect model of godliness that we have. What he taught, how he lived, and he spent years teaching and walking out what it means to live a godly life. So I'm super excited about this series that we're starting today because we're going to look at the life of Jesus and we're going to learn about who Jesus was, what he stood for, what he taught, what can we take away from his life and his teachings in an effort to hopefully be more like Jesus. Amen? So I think it'll be really fun. Let me tell you what we're going to talk about since this is the first week of the series. Let me tell you kind of what to expect for the month of March. Because I believe if you come to church this month, you'll walk away saying, man, I really know Jesus better. I feel like I know him better. Um, Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Jesus on real love. What does real love look like according to Jesus? Then next week, we'll talk about Jesus on real peace. The week after that, we'll talk about Jesus on real servanthood. The week after that, which will be Good Friday, we'll talk about Jesus on real grace. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll talk about Jesus on real victory. What does it look like to live in the victory of Jesus? Aren't you thankful that we can live in victory because he came, he died, and he rose again? Amen. So we're going to celebrate Easter at the end of the month, and I'm really looking forward that to, uh, to that together. Today, we're talking about Jesus on real love. And love is an interesting word in the English language because it's kind of vague, right? Like I could love Pringles potato chips and I could love my wife, but hopefully those two aren't the same. You know what I mean? Like, I love you, baby. Okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you think I'm cute? Does that mean you like hanging out with me? Or does that mean you wanna commit the rest of your life to me till death do us part? Those are very different things, right? I know you say you love me, but you also said you love Taco Bell a few minutes ago, so I'm not sure what to think of that. My dad tells this funny story. When I was probably like four years old or so, he and my mom bought me my first puppy, and I loved this puppy. His name was Pepper, and me and Pepper were like best of little friends when I was a kid, and I remember a dad tells a story that one day he saw me and Pepper playing together, and I think he was just so happy. He was just filled with joy and pride that I loved the dog, because... 
you know, a lot goes into buying your kid their first puppy. They wanted to find the right kind of puppy. You know, they had to coordinate going to get this puppy and buying this puppy. And then they surprised me with the puppy, you know. And so I think he was so happy that I just loved this puppy. And so he looked at me. My dad said, I love you, buddy. And I looked back at him and I smiled. I said, I love Pepper. <laughs> love is funny, right? But you know, in the Greek, there's not one word for love. The Greek, which is what the New Testament is translated in, there's actually eight different words for love. So it's much more descriptive. I'll share a few of them with you that are in the Bible. There's the word phileo, which stands for uh, friendship. So it's like a love between friends. There's storge, which is um, like affection, like if I'm affectionate towards someone or something. There's the word eros, which when they translated the Old Testament to Greek, it's all through the book of Song of Solomon. So if you know that book, it's like a physical intimacy type of love. I'm not going to teach about that today. We'll let Pastor Jim cover that in another message. <laughs> and then there's the word agape. Agape is the most used word for love in the Bible, and it means an unconditional, divine, selfless love. This is the kind of love that's referred to when the Bible says that God is love. Agape, it's unconditional, selfless. This is also the kind of love mentioned when Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. He uses the word agape, love with an unconditional and a selfless love. In Matthew chapter eight, there's a story about Jesus and it's only four verses. So, you know, if you, if you blink, you can miss it. But in these four verses, um, there's such an amazing picture of what it meant to Jesus to love. So I wanna read it with you and, and kind of break it down today. It's in Matthew chapter eight. It says, verse one, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. So it's implied that Jesus had just gotten done teaching on the mountainside and in doing so, he had drawn a crowd. Now he was likely now headed back down from the mountainside to town and they followed him. Verse two, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now it's pretty clear in this story that this man approached Jesus. Jesus wasn't out looking for this man or nor was he just walking around killing time, but he had been teaching and he still had this crowd with him, right? But this man stops Jesus. In verse three, Jesus reached out his hand. He touched the man. He said, I'm willing be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. One thing I love about this story is when you see Jesus, Jesus was ready for this, right? You know, if you look at a lot of Jesus' miracles, a lot of the miracles in the Bible, they end up coming to him. He's just kind of doing his thing, and then out of nowhere, an opportunity comes up to love on somebody. You think about his first recorded miracle, right? He's at this wedding, and his mom comes up to him, and she's like, Jesus, we need wine now. Now, picture that for a moment. I'd probably be like, okay, well, I can run to H-E-B. It's right down the street. Grab my wallet. Make sure I have my ID to grab some wine, mother. And, uh, but no, she's like, no, we need it now. Because in those days, it was a, a huge disgrace for the family if they ran out of wine at a wedding party. So Jesus lovingly saved them from disgrace, and he turned the water into wine. Or how about the lady with the issue of blood? Jesus was headed... Um, to a guy named Jairus' house. And Jairus was a real, he was an important guy. And his daughter was dying. So I'm sure there was some rush to get Jesus there. And there were crowds all around him. But somebody reached out and touched Jesus. And he felt it. So he stopped. He turned around. He looked at the lady. And he healed her. Jesus was always ready. And I believe if we're going to learn from Jesus, we will learn that real love is always ready. I, I used to love basketball. I still do love basketball, but I used to play it all the time. And I remember when I was younger, I would always look at older people and I would think, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to stop playing basketball, you know. I would be ready to play at the drop of a hat. I would keep my basketball shoes in my car. And back in the day, I had my little Air Maxes. And before that, I had my little Nike Shocks. Anybody remember Nike Shocks? I don't know what happened to those, but I'd be ready to, to you know, show off my my newest crossover from the And One mixtape. Come on, some of you guys remember those days. But man, I, you know, I played all the time, so I was in pretty good shape too. So if you hit me up and you were like, hey, let's go play ball, I'd go play. We could run for hours. I would play all night, you know. 
But what happened? Well, I grew up. You know, I started working more. I got married. I had a couple beautiful kids. And if you were to hit me up right now after church and say, hey, man, let's go play ball, I probably would not be able to play ball and just head out there because I have other priorities in my life, right? And that's, that's obviously a silly example. But what I love about Jesus is that he's always ready to love people. It isn't something that he just did whenever he could get around to it. It's who he was. Like, yeah, Michael, I want to be loving, but, you know, I have a lot going on. I'll try to remember to be loving the best I can when I can get around to it. But love isn't something that we try to remember. It's something that we're learning to be. Love is the well out of which we live. Love should be the source of all of our motivations. In Ephesians 5, Jesus said, or in Ephesians 5, Paul said, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ has loved us. We walk in it. Everywhere we go, we're walking in love. And that's what we see here with Jesus. He's just walking, right? He's not out looking for this leper. He's not out thinking, okay, I'm going to perform a miracle and show everybody. No, clearly he's had a busy day teaching this large group of people. And apparently he's leading a hike down this mountain, which would be enough to put some of us in a bad mood, sucking for air, looking for our, our Stanley Cup or our Gatorade, right? But Jesus stops in the middle of all of it. He stops. Why? Because love is always ready. It's not something that, that's a sometimes thing, but it's how we walk. It's how we move. It's the source of our actions. So Jesus sees this leper who is in pain, who is desperate, who needs someone to love him, someone to see him, and Jesus stops. Leprosy was a terrible disease. It produced sores on your body that that oftentimes would, um, well, always would, would spread from being just sores on your body to, you know, start eating away at other parts of your body. You would lose your, your fingernails, and then you would start to lose, you know, fingers and toes, and then you would even start to lose limbs. And it would just keep eating away at your body until you die. It was death by attrition, basically. And this process could take years and sometimes even decades. So if you were a leper, you were basically already considered dead, But in some ways, it was worse because they didn't want anyone near you. So as a leper, you were basically banished outside of the city limits. And lepers couldn't get within six feet of people. If it was a windy day, lepers couldn't get within 150 feet of people. There were even times in history where priests would pronounce a leper dead before they would banish them. So they were pretty much considered dead, but they were so ostracized from community. It was very sad. Talk about outcasts. Talk about beyond hope, right? And here's the really sad part about this is in Jesus' day, a widely held belief about lepers was that they were lepers because they had unreleased sin in their lives. It's said that there were Pharisees, which were the Jewish religious leaders of the day, that would actually brag about belittling and treating lepers poorly as if to make an example or a statement towards sin itself. So not only were they banished, but they were ridiculed and they were judged. You wanna talk about the least of these? Well, that was a leper. Sure, be good to the widow and orphan, but the leper, nah, that's, that's too far. These guys are sinners. These guys deserve what they have. These guys had it coming. Does that sound familiar? You ever met a Christian who almost seems happy when someone gets punished? Well, I tried to tell them. I knew that was going to happen. That's what you get. And this is how people felt about lepers. I'm sure there were people in the crowd who were thinking, how dare this leper approach Jesus? Some of them maybe even thought that Jesus would rebuke or condemn or at the very least ignore this man. But Matthew 8 verse 3 says, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. Jesus didn't have to touch him. Jesus reached out as if to say, you know what, this love is for you. Real love is not conditional. There is no one too far gone. There is no one unworthy of my love. See, real love is for everyone. That sounds like agape love, right? If love is unconditional, then by definition, it can't be earned. Jesus' love was not based on the other person. Jesus loved because he was committed to agape love. 
Matthew 5, Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be called children of your Father in heaven. In other words, real love is loving people who are hard to love. And right when I said that, someone popped in your mind, right? Come on, don't lie. Be honest. That person that you're picturing right now, that person, loving that person, that's real love. Wanting the best for that person, that's real love. That coworker or classmate who always gives you a hard time. The parent at your kid's Little League game who's always so mean to you or your kid. That Philadelphia Eagles fan at work who will never shut up about it. (laughs) Just kidding. Hey, if you're an Eagles fan, I'm sorry. You have to love me, all right? Agape. (laughs) Jesus said it. I'll never forget my brother had this little league coach who was a good guy, but he was just kind of a a good old boy, you know? So the baseball practice would be half practice and half the coach drinking with his buddies, you know what I mean? And so my brother was there and they were getting ready to take batting practice and the, the coach had the pitching machine out and my brother hit first, so he got in the batter's box. The coach put the ball in the pitching machine and bang, it hit my brother, right? He's like 10 years old. So the coach starts kind of messing with the pitching machine, you know, and puts the second ball in. Bang, it hits my brother again. I kid you not, this happened like at least five times. Finally, the coach is like, well, I I can't figure this thing out. I think it's broken. We're just going to end practice for the day. Some practice for Jeff, right? Sounds like he had a great time. So he comes home and he has whelps all over him. And, you know, I'm his big brother, so I'm kind of laughing. But my mom, she didn't think it was too funny, right? There are some people who make it really hard to love them. But, you know, I could tell you, my brother, he loved that coach. He may not have agreed with everything that he was doing. You wouldn't find G cracking open a beer with the coaches at 10 years old, right? He didn't love that he was getting hit by the pitching machine. But he loved his coach. He loved his coach's family. He loved his teammates. He uh, doesn't mean he did never get mad. Doesn't mean he didn't ever stand up for himself. I mean, we know that... Jesus flipped temple tables, right? Love sometimes can make us angry because we care so much about the person. Love can push you to anger, but an anger motivated by love doesn't respond the same way as anger motivated by things like envy and jealousy or hate. So my brother, he always loved his coach. He always loved the coach's family, always loved his teammates. And I can tell you to this day, he's told me about people he grew up playing with who will reach out to him when they're going through a hard time. He's been able to share God's love and share God's hope with them. Why? Because he just kept on loving. And my mom did too for the most part, all right? (laughs) Now, I want to say this. I don't want anyone to hear me wrong. Love is not the same as approval. We as Christians aren't supposed to go around approving of everything in the name of love. And I know sometimes as Christians, we feel like because the world is so crazy and confusing, we almost have to choose between the two. But loving someone doesn't mean that we approve of everything they do. We can hate sin. We can even speak against sin. But we should always love the person. God wants us to always love the person. People should never walk away from an interaction with a Christian questioning our love for them. Because agape love is not something that has to be earned. And I know that there are some of you here today, man, who you've been burned by love. And I'm not encouraging you to remove boundaries in your life. If someone is hurting you or hurting those you love, it's not loving to continually put yourself or to put those you love in a position to be harmed. Nor is it loving to enable the person harming you to continue that pattern in their lives. So I'm not saying to be sloppy with love, but I want to encourage you that we never stop loving. We never quit wanting the best for people. We never hold bitterness or unforgiveness in our heart. Sometimes we do have to love from a distance, but as Christians, we never stop loving. I know that's easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? But real love is for everybody. I think it's interesting how this story with the leper ends, because in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, this threw me for a minute because I was thinking, why wouldn't Jesus want everyone to know what happened, right? But then I was reminded of this story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18. 
He says this, he says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee who was like a religious leader, right? Respected man. The other was a tax collector. Tax collectors were the most hated people, right? Everyone felt like tax collectors were all, always ripping them off, right? So you have this Pharisee and this tax collector. Jesus said, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. He was real proud of himself, right? Jesus said, but the tax collector, he stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, it was that man rather than the Pharisee who went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. See, loving like Jesus loves is not about us. It's not about what we can get out of it. Real love often costs us something and it's not self-serving. Real love is humble. It's an act of humility. I know you've seen those people on social media who will go around and they'll, they'll give people money who need it and I think there can be really good intentions with that. I'm all for blessing people. But I know that you've seen some of them where you can tell it's more about them and their channel and what they're trying to do than it is even the person, right? It's like, bro, that $5 you just gave him isn't gonna change his life, you know? It just doesn't feel right. I, I don't know if you've seen those people before, but, but I can tell you it's great that they give them money. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, the money will fade. But you know what doesn't fade? What's more important is the fact that somebody stopped Somebody saw me. Somebody cared about me. Somebody showed me the love of Jesus, even when there was nothing to get out of it. They didn't do it for likes or subscribers or for attention. And Jesus basically said, listen, I'm not trying to build my following. My God will take care of that. So don't even go tell people. Because I didn't do this for me. I did this for you. Real love takes humility. Real love is motivated by a desire of wanting to help someone in need, wanting to help this leper because real love has the humility to look at this story and to say, you know what? I am this leper. See, in the same way that this leper was damned to death, in the same way that disease was eating away at this man, in the same way that this man had no business being in the presence of Jesus because he was unclean, so too am I. Humility says, I was once infected with the plague known as sin. I was once unclean and unworthy. I was once on a path to death, but Jesus stopped. Jesus showed me love. Jesus took my sin and shame to the cross. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I don't show you love out of pity. I don't show you love from my high horse. I love you because I am you, because I get you, but God saved me, and I know he can save you too. Amen. First John 4, 8, it says we love because he loved us first. We don't walk around like Pharisees thinking we're better than everyone because maybe we don't struggle with the same things that they do. No, we realize that our goodness pales in comparison to the goodness of our God. And if he can love us, then we should love everyone. Mark 12, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Notice there's no qualifying statement here. Love your neighbor if you like them, wouldn't that be nice? Love your neighbor if you think they deserve it. Love your neighbor if they're as successful as you. No, he says, love your neighbor as if they were you. Treat them how you would like to be treated. Yeah, but I've worked hard to be who I am. Well, that's awesome. And there's a lot of blessings that come with that, but love isn't one of them. Real love is not conditional. So how do we love like Jesus? What does Jesus look like? Well, Jesus' love is always ready. Jesus' love is for everybody. Jesus' love is humble. Now, as I close, I want to go back to the leper for a moment because I think there's something else so significant about this touch. You know, it was against the law to touch a leper. 
people didn't want people touching lepers and spreading the disease. So I don't know if we understand what a big deal it was that Jesus reached out and touched him. Most likely it had been years since this man had felt any kind of touch, any kind of meaningful touch from anyone. But Jesus stopped, he reached out, and he touched him. Now we ask, was Jesus breaking the law? Well, not really, because the moment he touches this man, he's no longer a leper. He's cleansed. See, real love restores. Jesus left people changed. You see it with the leper, he, he sent him to the priest. You see it with the, with, with the lady caught in the act of adultery. He loves her, he forgives her, but he says, listen, go and sin no more. Jesus was not just interested in helping people or being kind to people. He was interested in seeing them restored, whatever that took. If that meant comforting them, so be it. If that meant standing up for them, so be it. If that meant challenging them and flipping over temple tables, so be it. Because real love is interested in restoration. Loving like Jesus says, loving like Jesus says, I know the world sees someone beyond restoration. The world sees a hopeless addict. The world sees someone on their fifth marriage, someone who is too old to go back and make things right. The world sees a person who is not worth my time a day, but my God sees your potential. My God sees who you can be, and so will I. Real love restores. Romans 2, it says God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Church, we have the incredible opportunity and responsibility to be the bearers of God's kindness to be the bearers of his goodness. We might be the only glimpse of Jesus that someone sees today. So let's make sure they see him. Let's make sure they feel him. Let's make sure that they know that there's a God out there who loves them. There's a God out there who sees past their hangups and sees into their potential. Nothing breaks down walls like love. Nothing open, opens hearts to the goodness like kindness, the goodness of God, like kindness. Jesus said that the world should know that we're Christians by the way we love each other. And I believe if we really love like Jesus, we'll see so many people open up their hearts. Because after all, isn't that what we're all looking for? Isn't that what we're all searching for? Someone to love us, someone to believe in us, someone to see us. It's so important that we love well. And for those of us who can't see past our own hangups, who can't imagine how God could really love us, can I encourage you that God sees your potential too? Isn't it interesting that this leper had the courage to walk up to Jesus? Sure, he was desperate, but I have to believe that deep down under all those nasty sores, he believed that he could be made new. You may have some nasty scars this morning, you may carry with you some things that you're not proud of, maybe even stuff that nobody even knows about, but can I encourage you this morning, remember the leper. You don't have to run away from Jesus. You can run to Jesus. You can kneel at the feet of Jesus and you can know that you'll always be met with a real, agape, unconditional love. See, how do we love like Jesus? Well, Jesus' love is always ready. Jesus' love is for everybody. Jesus loves from a place of humility, not because I'm better than you, but because, man, Jesus saved me too. And finally, in Jesus lies a love that always has the power to restore. How many of you guys believe that this morning? How many of you guys receive that this morning? So can I pray for you before we go? Dear God, I thank you so much for everybody here today and watching online. Lord, I thank you for your love for each and every one of us. And God, I pray that every person within the sound of my voice would just know your love. I pray not only would we know your love, but that we would show your love to those around us. You know, I want to take a moment just to do the Thing that we do every time we get together, the most important time. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I, 
um, don't really know the love of Jesus like you're talking about. I've never really experienced it. I've never really, you know, you know, accepted that love before. Well, John 3.16, the most quoted verse in the Bible, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. That whoever is you, that whoever is me. So if you're here today and you say, you know, I would like to receive that. I would like to receive his love, to receive the gift of salvation. I'd like to spend eternity in heaven. Well, if that's you today, all you have to do is call on his name and open up your heart. I would love to say a prayer for you. On the count of three, I would just love to ask you to lift your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand or come forward. I would just love to know who I'm praying with this morning. So if you would like to say that prayer, if you'd like to receive the love of Jesus, on the count of three, would you just lift your hand and I want to pray with you. One, two, three. Hands are going up. Amen. I see those hands. Say, I want to receive God's love. I want to receive salvation. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've said that prayer before. I've given my heart to Jesus, but, you know, honestly, I, I've kind of slipped away. I haven't really lived close to God. And today, I would like to return. I would like to rededicate my life to Him. If that's you, I would love to pray with you too. Would you just raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. I see those hands. You say, I want to return to Jesus. I want to rededicate my life today. Amen. Well, I'm going to pray, and if you would, would you repeat after me, and we're going to pray it with our lips, and let's mean it from our hearts today. I want to invite you all to pray along with us. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and that's why you send Jesus. So today, I give you my life. I make you my Lord and Savior. And I thank you that I'll never be the same. My past is forgiven. My future is heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give it up for those who prayed that prayer? Listen, really quickly before I pray the prayer of blessing, if you said that, I just want that prayer, I just want to encourage you that we have a gift for you. On your way out, there are white packets, and in those white packets, we have a book from our pastors called 30 Days to a New Beginning and some other gifts and resources for you. The book is all about helping you understand the decision that you made and what the next steps are for you to be able to experience all that God has for you. <clears throat> I believe you just made the most important decision of your life. But just like any relationship, it takes time and effort to grow. And we want to help you do that and be there for you every step of the way. And then I want to encourage you, too, to get baptized. Jesus said, believe and be baptized. When we're baptized, we're making a statement that when we go under the water, our old life is washed away. And we come up a new creation in Jesus. It's important, Jesus said, to do it. And we love to celebrate with people being baptized, making a declaration of their new life in Jesus. So if you would like to get baptized, they're going to put some information on the screen and on the LED wall behind me. You can go ahead and sign up to do that and we'll get you all set up. That's one of our favorite things to do is to celebrate with those of you who are being baptized. All right. Well, are you guys glad you came to church today? Good. I hope you leave feeling God's amazing, unconditional love for you, that you know He loves you, and that we want to go and show others that He loves us too. Amen. Can you stand to your feet with me? I want to pray for you. I want to remind you too that we have our prayer team. So if you came wanting personal prayer, we're going to have a prayer team up front, and they would love to pray with you. So if you want prayer, don't feel like you have to leave. They would love to pray with you. Just come up front, okay? All right, and to all the Eagles fans that I offended today, I'm sorry, but I can promise you I'm not alone on that, all right? No, I love you guys. Um, let me pray a prayer of blessing over you. How many of you guys are ready to receive? Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. See you guys later.